All right, we're ready to go. Okay, so uh, if you guys haven't met me already, my name is Spencer. Um, I'm one of the EM1s, and I'm going to do a clinical pearl today on a procedure on tube thoracostomy. Uh, let's say we're in CCT. We got this patient here. It's a 24-year-old man coming in, uh, chest pain, short of breath. Let's say he has some pain when he breathes in, um, denying any trauma, no infectious symptoms, no PE risk factors. Uh, we see his uh, physical exam. He's a little bit tachypneic, sat 93% on room air. Uh, decreased breath sounds on the left, but no tracheal deviation, no JVD. What's our differentials at this point? What are some of your thoughts? Is it even or off <laughs> It's our day. <laughs> Um, so on our differentials should be something maybe in the pleural cavity. We could be thinking things like uh, pneumothorax or even um, some things like a pleural effusion, hemothorax, chylothorax. Um, seeing as how this man um, is having some chest symptoms, we decide to get an x-ray. And it shows this. Any of the juniors want to take a chance at what they see? Yeah, so some decreased lung markings on the left. Uh, probably a pneumothorax. What is something that we want to do at this point? And now uh, we're going to be talking about <clears throat> a couple things here today. We're going to talk about indications, contraindications, procedure itself, complications, troubleshooting, and the drainage system involved with tube thoracostomies. Uh, tube thoracostomies. Um, there's several indications. There's a long list of them that I was able to find in um, an old textbook. Um, so some indications uh, in, a, in, a, in, the indica in the setting of blood or pedotrain trauma include chylothorax, hemothorax, hemonumothorax, hydrothorax, or tension. <clears throat> Although of note, tension pneumothoraxes need to be drained with needle decompression first and then can be converted to simple pneumothorax afterwards uh, with a chest tube. Um, some other medical indications that we don't usually think about are things like empyemas, medical uh, malignant pleural effusions, uh, pleurodesis and recurrent pleural effusions. Um, there aren't really any real contraindications, absolute contraindications to doing a chest tube, uh, but there are some relative ones. Uh, these things include things like overlying skin infection, uh, coagulopathies, uh, large boules, pulmonary adhesions, previous thoracostomies. Um, I was reading that, uh, in, I was reading that uh, even in the most ideal conditions, uh, Rates of infection and pyema formation due to th tube thoracostomy is, high to, is as high as 25%. Uh, so we want to reduce the rate of infection as much as possible. Um, pleural adhesions and uh, prior, chest, prior thoracostomies can also uh, complicate the procedure by distorting the uh, original anatomy and obstructing tube insertion. Um, it can potentially increase the risk of parenchymal injury. Uh, where do we actually want to do the procedure? It's going to be here. It's going to be our triangle of safety, which we should always remember. Um, what we want to do is look for uh, these anatomical landmarks, the base of the axilla, the lateral edge, the latissimus dorsi, the pectoralis major lateral edge, and the fifth intercostal space. Um, the reason why we want to do it in this, uh, in this triangle is because uh, two main reasons. When we breathe, uh, our diaphragm rises to about the level of the nipple. And also, this area is probably uh, the least muscular area of the chest wall, and it's easier to actually gain access to pleural cavity from here. Um, how are we going to do? How are we going to do the procedure? Uh, so first, we should prepare the patient. If it's not emergent, we can do a consent. Uh, we're going to position the patient. Uh, we can consider putting on soft restraints. We should put on a pulse oximeter. Um, put them on supplemental oxygen and uh, re-identify the space that we're going to do it at. Uh, consider antibiotics. There's not, much, uh, there's not much evidence towards using antibiotics prophylactically outside of trauma. Um, if we are going to give antibiotics, we should give a first-generation cephalosporin just before making the skin incision. Um, and we should have our other supplies, uh, so other supplies on hand. So we should prepare the drainage apparatus uh, with a water seal. Um, when we perform a procedure, there's a couple uh, things that we should consider first before we're going to actually do it. Uh, first is the type of anesthetic that we're going to use. Um, we could use uh, either lidocaine, bupivacaine if you want a long-acting local anesthetic. Um, we could do with or without epi. Just remember that for lidocaine, with epi, the maximum weight-based dose is 7. And without is going to be uh, 4.5. Then bupivacaine is 3. Without is 2.5. Um, chest tubes. So there isn't really much uh, that I was able to find in terms of hard guidelines towards which chest tube toward, for which indication. Um, there isn't there isn't really much evidence e even towards uh, even towards uh, 
sizes of chest tubes. In general, when people say small bore chest tube, they mean uh, 14 French or less. When they say large bore, they probably mean something in a range of 16 and higher. Um, some studies uh, talk about medium bore chest tubes that are in the range of 16 to 24. Um, but there's a whole lot of indications. There's a whole lot of uh, indications that we use chest tubes for, and uh, different societies have different uh, different recommendations for what sizes can be used in these cases. Generally, in the cases of trauma, ATLS recommends 20 to 32 French, but there's some newer studies saying that even 20 French is not inferior to 20 to 32. Uh, for pneumothoraces, there's some. Uh, initially, we would be thinking about using a small bore chest tube, like 10 to 14 French. Um, but newer Cochrane studies are suggesting that needle aspiration might be just as good as uh, small bore chest tubes. And even older studies saying that needle aspiration is just as good as uh, even large bore chest tubes, like greater than 20 French. Um, this information, uh, just uh, as a note, is from a 2010 review paper. And a lot of it is taken from the British Medical Society for um, British Medical Thoracic Society. Um, so it might be a little bit old. Um, but the trend I'm seeing is that 10 to 14 French is sufficient for a lot of, uh, for a lot of indications. Um, in the rare cases that there's like something more, uh, something larger necessary, then we might want to consider 28 French. Um, how, are we how are we going to actually perform the procedure? Everything should be performed serially. Um, so get your sterile drapes, sterile mask, um, perform your timeout. Don't use a trocar. We're going to first identify where we're going to do the uh, procedure itself. So we're going to re-identify that triangle of safety, uh, the fifth intercostal space along the mid-axillary to anterior axillary line. With our actual anesthetic, we're going to go uh, maybe one intercostal space below where we're actually going to go for it. Um, so right above the sixth rib, we're going to make a small wheel and then go right above the rib, the superior border of the rib, to avoid that neurovascular bundle. We want to keep advancing the needle actually into the pleural cavity, and uh, as per Reichman's, they suggest giving two to three mils of local anesthetic into the pleural, into the pleura. Uh, then we're going to actually uh, use our scalpel, make a three to five uh, incision with number ten scalpel blade, one rib below the desired ICS that we're going to go at. So that's going to be over the sixth rib if we want to go into fifth intercostal space. Uh, use your, we're going to use the Kelly clamp to keep bluntly dissecting into that tract down the subcutaneous tissue in a cephalic direction to the rib right above it. Uh, once we get to that rib, we're going to, orient the, our, we're going to orient our clamp right above the superior border, and uh, you're going to forcefully put it into the pleura. Um, we might have to use a twisting motion, um, and uh, what Reichmans also suggests is that we can um, we can use our opposing hand to provide some like counterforce as to not as to not push it too much into the into the pleural cavity. Once that happens, uh, we're going to spread the jaws of the clamp and try to uh, enlarge, try to uh, dilate that tract. Place your finger into the into the tract into the through the subcutaneous through the subcutaneous tissue uh, through the intercostal muscles into the pleural cavity and break apart any loose adhesions that you feel uh, between the lung and uh, and the pleura. If you feel too many adhesions, you might want to consider going at a different site. Now we're going to actually prepare the chest tube. Uh, you want to uh, try to. Uh, have the chest tube so that the end of the chest tube is sort of laying over going to be overlaying from where you make the skin incision to the apex of the lung. Um, so place one culling clamp at the edge of this at the distal end of the chest tube where you're going to actually uh, guide it through the cavity. The other one is going to be at the distal end of the chest tube where you're going to where it's going to exit the actual uh, exit the skin. Um, guide the chest tube into place posterior and superiorly. Uh, ideally, you actually want to, Reichman suggests using the finger and actually guiding it, your dominant finger, and using your finger to guide it into the tract, where you can actually confirm the intrapleural placement of the chest tube. Then you want to secure it using a 0 or 1 -oh silk suture. Um, I've read that making a purse string is not necessary. Is not necessary. Um, however, uh, it does help with actually closing up that wound after, after the chest tube is pulled at the very end of their hospital stay. Um, after it's done, we want to place an occlusive dressing. Um, so what the occlusive dressing is going to consist of is going to be some uh, petroleum gauze. 
and you actually want to place a petroleum gauze over the incision site, over the chest tube, um, put some other dry gauze on top of it, then put some of the benzo in that's always in CCT that we never use around that area, place some tape on top, and that'll make sure that it's, uh, that, that makes sure it's airtight. Um, Reichmann's also uh, places emphasis on avoiding the patient's nipple. Um, when it's done, we're going to connect the chest tube to our drainage system. And then we're going to take a post-procedure uh, x-ray. And this x-ray shows that it's all the way on the right side and uh, pointing towards the apex of the lung, I believe. Now, our tube is in, and uh, we think that we're done. But are we really? There's some things that we should look out for. Complications. Um, what can happen? Malpositioning of the tube itself. Uh, so we want to obtain the chest tube. We want, we want to, to prevent malposition of the tube. We want to do everything that we can to position it in the correct place. Uh, make sure that we, ch we, we check the position of the tube afterwards with an x-ray. Um, make sure that we uh, don't violate that triangle of safety because it's going to prevent us from injuring other organs that are below the diaphragm or a little bit too, um, too low. Uh, like the spleen, liver, stomach, esophagus, nerve. Um, we're going to also uh, make sure that we bluntly dissect all the way up to the pleura just so that we don't accidentally place the chest tube uh, subcutaneously. Um, apparently subcutaneous placement is, uh, is a rare complication ranging between like 1 to 1.8%. Um, we should watch out for uh, unstable chest fracture. Uh, we should watch out for uh, unstable chest wall um, like rib fractures, hematomas, and rushing the chest tube, which can uh, lead to subcutaneous placement. Emphysema can also occur. We have subcutaneous emphysema um, right next to the chest tube. Apparently, this is like a self-limiting, um, self-limiting process. So you really you shouldn't have to worry too much about it. Um, obstruction of the tube itself can actually can actually occur with improper placement or with kinking of the tube or with actually obstruction of the tube with some sort of clots. Um, there are things that you could do such as repositioning the tube. If you see that the water seal in your um, in your drainage apparatus isn't fluctuating with the respirations that might lead you to suspect that the um, chest tube is obstructed. Uh, otherwise what Else we might consider doing is something called milking or stripping the tube which is where we block off one end of the tube and uh, pull the other end and let go. Uh, but this is something we should do with caution because it can actually cause a lot of, uh, it can actually cause damage to the tissue. Um, there's something called re-expansion pulmonary edema, which is uh, like, it has an incidence rate of like 1%, but a very high mortality rate. And this it can actually occur if the lung expands way too quickly. Uh, one way to avoid this is to initially leave the tube off of suction, just to gravity on the one way, on the water seal or the one way valve. Um, and infection, dysrhythmias, if you, actually, if you accidentally touch the, uh, the pericardium um, or touch the heart can occur. You want to just reposition your tube in that case or infection. Uh, one thing to note is that when you reposition a tube, tubes go out, they never go back in. So if you want to pull the tube, that's okay, but you never want to push the tube in further after you've already finished the procedure. Um, this is the Pleurivac that we use at the three chamber water seal that we use over at our facility in Kings County. Um, water seal is a misnomer. So water seal used to refer to a three chamber system where the middle chamber is basically, it's like a straw inside a glass of water where you could blow bubbles in, but you can't really bring air the opposite direction unless you suck it, uh, suck the straw. Um, so what this, and, and the typical three chamber one used to use uh, a, a third chamber filled with water that actually regulates the amount of suction that the, uh, that the actual uh, suction suction device will apply in the end. Um, so what this is, is something called a dry suction and dry seal device, meaning that there's no actual water in the, in the device that regulates air going in one direction. It's actually all mechanical, mechanically regulated. And there's no, um, there's no third chamber filled with water. It's actually just that uh, red dial with the letter A, uh, meaning that it's working if you see like this uh, cap floating inside of it. Um, there's some things I want to talk about regarding the drainage apparatus that we always uh, that we don't, always don't really realize. Um, obviously, so this is the device that we have. Number one tube connects to the patient. Um, the little blue thing on the bottom that's our indicator for uh, for um, uh, for that intrapleural uh, pressure that's applied. 
And what we're going to see is that if there's an air leak, meaning if there's uh, air coming from somewhere within that system through the tubes into the collection chamber and out through that, um, out that one way, mechanical one way valve, it's going to be like you're blowing air through a straw and you're gonna see bubbles coming out from that blue water area, okay? Um, our nurses, I, I've, seen, um, I've seen staff members, I've seen uh, physicians all apply way too much suction on when they plug in the device initially to the point where they see bubbles coming out of it if you, even without connecting the device to the patient. Um, this completely, uh, it, it, it uh, nullifies the purpose of that, of that blue chamber, which is to show you whether there's bubbles coming from within the system, not bubbles pulling out for no reason from outside the system. So what we see, and if we see bubbles in that, in that tiny little uh, blue area, that means air leak. Air can be coming from somewhere, either from the tube itself, like along the tubing somewhere, um, from the dressing, if it's not a completely occlusive dressing, if it's allowing air into the system, or if there's some sort of uh, bronchopleural or alveolar pleural fistula that's causing air to go from the patient through the lungs into the pleura and then out that, back, out that, uh, out that tubing. Um, what we could do to check for an air leak is to go backwards. Uh, basically, that's the only time when we should clamp the tubing. Otherwise, tubes should not be clamped, or you're going to be backing up air from air, blood, whatever it is, uh, and just leaving it inside pleura. It's like not having the chest tube in in the first place. Um, so clamp only when indicated. We should clamp when checking for air leaks, clamp when changing the, the, the drainage bottle itself, or clamp when removing the tube at the very end. And lastly, we should also remember to keep the system below chest level. Um, overall, uh, there's going to be three things to remember. Uh, remember that triangle of safety. It's very important to keep your proper landmarks and place it where, it, where the chest tube uh, belongs. Suction is not always necessary. I know we love to put on suction right away, but that can increase the, it can increase your, um, uh, the, the, it could increase the chance of getting re-expansion pulmonary edema. And we don't have to clamp the tube. It's, uh, it could be left as a one-way valve. Air is going to come out of the pleural cavity, out the patient. Um, nothing's going to go back in. And here's my, here's my references.